Okay, so let's look at section four beyond Mendelian heredity. So what did Gregor Mendel look at? So he looked at a dominant versus a recessive trait within pea plants, always having one dominant trait and one recessive trait. And you would only express the recessive trait when you had two of the alleles making it homozygous recessive. And you would express the dominant trait whenever it was shown within the genotype, which means if it was homozygous dominant or if it was heterozygous, which means it had one dominant allele and one recessive allele with it. But genetics isn't cut and dry like that. We have a few different types of genetics um, that these patterns are more common in evolved creatures like us. And so we actually don't see this dominant versus recessive as much. We see other patterns. One of them is incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance occurs when an offspring has an intermediate phenotype between the two parents, which means, for the example of snapdragons, red is dominant and white is dominant. So in a test cross for them, if you would have a hetero, I'm sorry, a homozygous dominant, so big R, big R for the red snapdragon crossed with a white snapdragon that was also homozygous, which would be, we'll just say um, WW, when they have an offspring, the red and the white aren't shown. Instead, this RW phenotype with this heterozygous phenotype shows a pink flower. So it's an incomplete dominance. Both are being expressed, but because when you mix red and white together, you get pink, an intermediate color comes across. And so Mendel's crosses never show this intermediate color, but this is really something that's cool. This happens quite a bit within plants. Then we have poly, poly meaning many, genetic inheritance. This is when several characteristics affect a trait that you have. So I'm going to show you this chart that's right here. This is actually pretty cool uh, when you think about it. So it is showing eye color. Well, here's the deal. If you have parents, one and two, both have brown eyes. I mean, how many of us have parents with brown eyes? Of course we do. You actually have a 19% chance of having blue eyes, 75% chance of having brown eyes, and a 7% chance of having green eyes. In fact, by the way, green eyes are the rarest of all eye colors, just to throw that out there for you. Um, if we look at the combinations of these, you can actually see the chances that you have of inheriting that color. Now, how many of you are like, well, I have brown eyes just like my dad? Well, go look at your dad's brown eyes. Are they the same as yours? Probably not. The pixelation and coloration of your eyes can vary dramatically. In fact, these percentages that you see here can be a combination that you show. My daughter... I have green eyes. My husband has blue eyes. My daughter had a 50% chance of having blue eyes or green eyes, and she has blue eyes. If you look at my husband's blue eyes and my green eyes, my daughter has the color of my husband's eyes, but the coloration of my eyes, which means the gradient, it goes from dark to light, um, from the outside of the pupil to the inside, and mine, my daughter's does the same as mine. So we may not have the same eye color, but we have the same coloration throughout. Hers is just in blue and mine is in green. Another example of this would be skin color, hair color, and pretty much height too. By the way, some of these physical features that we have and the polygenic inheritance can be influenced by the environment of which we're born into. An example would be height. You have an, a, usually a combination between your mom and dad's height. My example would be my sister and I are both six foot. I have a sister that's five, seven, eight-ish, and I have a brother that's six, four. My mom is five, two and a half, and my dad is five, eight. So how on earth do they have this poly inheritance trait that allowed for them to have tall children? Well, my parents are both the shortest ones in their family. My mom's dad is 6'1". My grandmother, my dad's mom, was 5'11". 
So there are some tall. My dad's siblings are much taller than him. Like my uncle is 6'3". My aunt is 5'11". So they're much taller than him. Some things that can also influence things like height are malnutrition. If you don't have enough substance, such as a balanced diet, you actually won't obtain the total height you're meant to reach, that your genes are programmed to go. That doesn't mean that you're just malnourished. It means if you eat junk food all the time and you don't eat healthy foods, it means your body isn't able to make enough proteins and bone and calcium and stuff that it needs. So it's not able to manufacture the products it needs to grow healthy and tall. So you need to make sure that you're achieving a balanced diet, not just eating junk food all the time. Otherwise, you won't be as tall as you're supposed to be. But polygenetic inheritance is really how a lot of traits in humans go. Then we have multiple alleles. Multiple alleles. This is your blood type. Uh, it's hair color and plants, but we're going to talk about blood type. So if you can see here, this is the genotypes. So note for each of these here, for A and B, there are two possible genotypes. One, you have a recessive trait. And two, you have the dominant. So in this case, you have your homozygous dominant, and this one, you're heterozygous. Homozygous dominant, heterozygous. In this one, you have an example of um, your incomplete dominance occurring. Both are being expressed here. So you actually are AB is a heterozygous dominant trait. And for this one, you are homozygous recessive. O is the universal, O negative, we'll do RH with this. This is the universal donor. They can donate to anyone. However, they can only receive blood from O negative people because they have what they call an antigens on the top. Think of an antigen as a little like plus or minus sign that's attached to these little circles. Your book on page 283 has a really nice antigen um, demonstration where it has the different shapes stuck to them. A and B would be different shapes. Your body recognizes this with your immune system. And what happens is, is you have what we call white blood cells. These are RBCs or red blood cells. They carry your oxygen. These RBCs are floating around and replaced about every 90 days. If you have a blood transfusion and you're A, B, you will, can get it from A, B, or O and still be fine. But if you're type A and you get a blood transfusion from A, B, these red blood cells that you just got that are saving your life, that are delivering oxygen, will be attacked by your white blood cells because it's looking at it as a foreign invader, a pathogen, because it doesn't recognize the antigens that are attached to it because they're not A antigens. O is the universal donor because it doesn't have any antigens attached to it, these proteins that are surface identification markers. And so then you're not going to be taken in from this. So when we start looking at these, these would be the possible genotypes, and we can just use a simple Punnett square. So I know that I am B positive. I also know that my mom is O and my dad is B. Which one of these Bs? I'm not really sure. My dad is probably going to be heterozygous because I think I have a sister that's O positive. But full disclosure, I don't know all my siblings' blood types. This is really important to know because when you go to a hospital, you should know what your blood type is. That way, if you have to get a blood transfusion for some way, you can. But they're quick tests now, and it's not like it used to be. So let's look at codominance. So codominance is a little bit different. Both traits appear at the same time. Now, when we talked about um, incomplete dominance and poly and multiple alleles, this is kind of like both of them. They're all showing this black and white, but it's an incomplete or codominance is both of the traits are showing. So as you can see here, we have our homozygous for both our white and our black. And what are we getting? We're getting these babies that are both black and white. So they're showing that codominance. This is really specific in animals. It's also true in human blood type. AB is an example of codominance. Both of them are being expressed. And so you can have multiple alleles and codominance within those multiple alleles. 
Um, you can also have a co um multiple alleles with incomplete dominance, depending on what it is. But for human blood type, we do have a codominance with multiple alleles. This is really important that we understand that this codominance condition, um, both of these traits are being expressed and they're being fully shown. So genes can be affected by the environment. I talked about diet earlier, but let's look at the Arctic fox or the jackrabbit or any other animal that you know changes its skin, its fur color pigmentation depending on the temperature outside. So what happens with these animals? Well, we have these little things called melanocytes in us. Melanocytes produce melanin. If you're fair complected or lighter in color, your melanocytes don't work so well. They don't produce a lot of melanin. If you're darker pigmentation, your melanocytes are rock stars and they're producing a ton of pigment. Now, how do these get kicked on and kicked off? Well, for us, our melanocytes turn on based on the amount of sunlight that we're getting. The more sunlight that you get, the more melanin that you'll produce to prevent your skin from burning. Otherwise, you develop skin cancer. But we have a fine line there because we have to absorb vitamin D. So we don't want it too dark because then you can't absorb vitamin D and you can become vitamin D deficient, which can lead to other health problems. So you really have to balance that fine line. Now, phenotypes can be affected by the conditions that we have. So like in the summer when you go outside, your skin gets darker. Just like the Arctic fox he turns brown in color in the summer, and then when it's white out and cold, he stops producing melanin and he turns white. Same with our jackrabbits. This is allowing them to blend in with their environment, creating camouflage. Human height is also determined by nutrition, which I already mentioned earlier, and we're going to look at a little picture of this. Also, personality and behavior are strongly influenced by environment and the roles you play. So when your parents tell you to stop doing something or to knock it off, they're just trying to make you a good person. So let's look at these two identical twins. These guys are part of a really unethical study, by the way. Um, so until like the 1980s, we tested people in not so good conditions. So what happened with this? These two gentlemen were born and given up for adoption. And a scientist went, hey, we should study that. They were adopted to two separate families of two social economic differences. This one was given to a higher um, income class family, and this one was given to a lower income class family. You can see the height difference between the two twins. They are identical twins, by the way. They are found much later in life after they reached adulthood. He received a college education and has multiple facets that he was actually way more successful in life where he was not. He did not receive a college education, also had a criminal record. So behavior can be triggered sometimes by just the environment in which you live in, but you can see the height. He received less nutritional value than this guy, obviously, and one is taller than the other. So height and nutrition does matter. This is also one of the reasons that we think people are taller now is because we actually have better nutrition now than what we did um, even 50, 60 years ago. So when we start talking about genes linked within chromosomes, so the law of independent assortment is kind of related to this. If the genes are on different chromosomes, the alleles of each gene can be sorted independently from each other. So what does that mean? So we see here the X and Y. Now I know I've told you the X is way bigger than the Y, but look at the size difference. The X is way bigger than the Y. So the X is going to have some alleles and traits that the Y is not. And so if they're recessive traits, they'll actually be expressed because they're found within the X, such as colorblindness. It will be expressed for this. Um, during meiosis, these genes get closer together on the same chromosome and are less likely to separate than genes that are far apart. Remember, we have that thing called crossing over that occurs in prophase one. If the genes are close together on the chromosome, then they're going to stick together. But if they're far apart, you could actually have something like crossing over occur in prophase one of meiosis, and then you'd have separate genes 
or more genetic variation within the species. Um, genes that are closely linked together as well, the traits are determined and they're said to be linked. Such as usually if you have um, a lighter skin tone, you'll have blue or green eyes. Or if you have a darker skin tone, you produce more melanin, you have um, a brown eye. Now that's not always true because obviously we can we are now seeing people that have blue eyes and darker colored skin. However, it has been true because of those traits are usually associated with people that live in places that didn't have as much sunlight or had a lot of sunlight. So they were protective. Um, we also see that hair color is also linked to skin tone. Lighter hair color is associated with fairer skin and darker hair color is associated with darker skin pigments. However, with hairstyling being something that a lot of females go to. It's hard to determine your natural hair color anymore because people dye their hair at such young ages. And so those can be altered that way where we can't necessarily see it. But we do know your genetic, your genes are somewhat closely linked together. And so we can also map out certain disorders and diseases for that too.